let's also talk about because um uh, while you were writing, I guess, uh, turn of the century, you were, you, you, this was a period of time where you, you know, as, and I found that, that, I, I mean, th- like I say, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, gush too much. It was uh, 20 years ago. I had oh, go on. It, sadly, but it was, but it really, uh, defined that era for me. And I think it was also just like where I was, uh, in my life at that time to watch sort of like this insanity that was taking place in New York at that time in terms of real estate, in terms of like this notion of like, I, I got to get involved in this like dot-com thing. And um, in fact, I, I did. Uh, and the company went out of business almost like Me right now. Uh, I got the, uh, I, I, I still have um, mini DV cams that came from yeah. uh, that. that, that no, and by, for, for, for your, the great majority of your listeners who aren't familiar with Turn of the Century, it is a novel. It is not a nonfiction book. I used to, before, before these last two books, I, I, I wrote novels. So, so yes, but I, I appreciate that. And it was, although it was a novel, but I mean, my, my conscious attempt at the time was to capture this weird moment that seemed like some kind of inflection point. Yeah, sure. And, 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 and I really think it did. And, but simultaneously, I mean, in, 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 in evil geniuses, you uh, look back on that era for yourself as one where you really weren't paying attention to what was actually going on. Oddly enough, because I, I found that, that, that novel very insightful of that moment, but there was another undercurrent, I guess, uh, that, that you were missing. Talk about that. I was paying attention certainly to the culture and the culture of money and idiots who would go around and saying, we're creating wealth for everyone. We're creating health wealth for everyone. I mean, it, it was satirical and it made fun of that stuff, but it was a, no- a, it was a novel and a novel that, you know, makes a big case about systemic inequality and insecurity is not really a novel. Probably I've never seen it, but you know, you know what I'm saying? So, so that isn't the, 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 the uh, mission or purpose of fiction so much. However, uh, but but to your point, and I, you know, repeatedly mea culpa in this in Evil Geniuses to say I wasn't really paying close enough attention or caring enough about oh there, there's a Rust Belt now oh manufacturing workers are now losing their jobs eh, too bad that's that's too bad it'll work itself out somehow because it always works itself out right it's it's all the industrial revolutions have led to it working sorting itself out somewhere. So yeah, yeah, I would say that my my relative affluence and, and relative success uh, led me to be uh, uh, inured to and and sort of not caring enough about this systemic change. And you know, also not not to not to 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 you know defend myself either. But but it, until the '90s, I, at least I should have been paying more attention by the '90s. But so much of what was done was not instant. You know, they did right. not cancel. So they did not repeal Social Security and Medicare. They did not repeal the EPA. They did not get rid of minimum wage laws. They did all these clever, it was an undermining. It was a slow motion change from the New Deal to the raw deal, as I call it. So, so it wasn't quite clear. The, the, the cultural change was the fact that a, a a freak like Donald Trump could be a respected famous person in the 1980s and 1990s was clearly, you know, he was a guy who couldn't have existed in, in the 1970s or before, you know, this ostentatious bully. Oh yeah, we love that. Um, uh, so I was aware more of the cultural changes that I, and of some of the political changes, but, but, but I, I, I was not aware nor was my professional mission at the time uh, about looking at those sort of systemic political economic changes. When did, when did this happen? It was in many respects, this is a, um, uh, this is a almost, I guess, a story of radicalization. Um, uh, the, when did, when, like, when was the moment uh, for you? I would say starting in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, I, I, I mentioned uh, an incident in the book where uh, one day in the end of 2006, I'd, I'd gone back to my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska for the last time. My parents had died and, and, uh, and, 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 and fell in one morning and talked for a couple of hours with these two airline pilots. And like, whoa, airline pilots. You know, I still had a, like a boys like, whoa, right. these are, these are 
professional heroes and all that. And they were just so they felt ruined, cheated. The whole system had, 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 had wrecked them. They didn't trust United Airlines. Why does the CEO get so much money? They lied about our pensions on and on and on and on. And, and it was like a moment that made me think like, whoa, this, this, you know, the, 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 there is something, I, it, if, if I had an epiphany on the road to Damascus, it was the road to Epley Airfield in Omaha, but still, it, it was, that was the thing that made me go like, wow, I, I have not been paying attention and this isn't the America, you know, that I grew up in. And, and then I started reading harder and thinking harder, um, you know, and then it was, <laughs> it was slow motion. I would say, you know, sometime that took, I would say most of a decade really to, to, so it was, it was, yes, a slow motion, middle-aged radicalization. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to me, too, because that it, particularly in that era, in, in 2005, 2006, we were seeing uh, United Airlines, we were seeing multiple major corporations basically throw off their pension. It went into the Pension Guarantee Trust. The Pension Guarantee Trust was like under very shaky ground at that point. It was almost the end of, it was almost the death, the, the final nail in the coffin of defined benefit uh, pensions right in that era. Totally. Well, like, but but again, it had been it had been coming. I mean, basically, totally starting in the eighties, they yep. just they decided no that norm of giving everybody a fixed pension. Well, you're not going to do that anymore. Right. Know? The experiment of the four hundred one k came in that era, but it took all these years uh, for it. And 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 we see it in the context of. I mean, there's many things: the rollback of the capital gains taxes, the uh, the idea that you can buy back your own stocks. These are all things that happened in the eighties, and we don't see the impact of these really in a clear way for at least a decade or two. Right. Um, it's also interesting to me that it was in Omaha that you had this moment. Having lived in New York for so many years, it was almost as if like, you know, maybe the, the going back oddly enough and comparing it to what life was like when you were a kid uh, or, you know, growing up might have been the sort of, you got an apples to apples uh, sort yeah, of- Yeah, no, I think, I think that's true. Also, in, in New York, I mean, one of the problems is with New York, I think, is that the, the creative class, the professional class, they all live together. And so therefore, if some, a lot of your friends and the people you see at parties and whatnot, even if you're not rich, and even if you're not working on Wall Street, are rich guys working on Wall Street, it's like, oh, yeah, they're my friends. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. And they're kind of a dick in that way. But no, it's, it's all fine. I think life in New York at the upper reaches economically uh, tends to uh, not serve the, the kind of uh, uh, clarity, if not radicalization about the economic system that uh, you're talking about. But yeah, I think Omaha was probably part of it. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But, you know, also, my, I mean, Warren Buffett was was a friend of my parents. Didn't make him rich, but he was a friend of theirs. And, and so actually that same trip to Omaha I went and saw for the first time at this wonderful little bookshop in the airport there, this shrine to Warren Buffett and all of his books and all this essentially, I mean, uh, created by this really smart guy who ran the bookstore. And, 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 and I began thinking about Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett as a very different kind of billionaire than say Donald Trump, well, Donald Trump's billions, but, but not, the, not the kind of, it's all about me and greed is good. He was a different kind of, you know, investor and rich guy. And it was also right then, which I also mentioned in the book, 2005, 2006, where Warren Buffett comes out more than once on television and says, you know, there is a class war. People, the right talks about this class war being waged. There is a class war. It's being waged by my side, by rich people, and we're winning and we shouldn't be. So yeah, those, all, all of those things together uh, were, were part of my, uh, uh, yeah, ra radicalization moment, you know, you know, uh, or if, if that's what we want to call it. Yeah. And I will say that's also a defense as to why I have no friends uh, anywhere. And so I am not uh, susceptible to any of those. Uh, the, <laughs> but that's, that's, I want to talk wise. about that keeps you hygienic. Exactly. Very, very hygienic, a little bit lonely, but uh, you, you work through that. 